There we go. All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this special meeting of the Lincoln Group of the District of Columbia. As you know, we generally don't have programs from June until uh, June, July, and August. But this year, the great opportunity came along to have our guest speaker tonight with a, an exciting new book. So we thought we would organize this on rather short order and we're pleased to see we're getting a nice turnout. Happy Juneteenth Day to everybody. Uh, uh, Juneteenth, of course, is one of several national holidays associated with Lincoln. Of course, Thanksgiving, Memorial Day was originally Decoration Day, wasn't it, for the, uh, the, L, the Union veterans? And President's Day helps mark Lincoln's birthday on the 12th of February. John Grinspan, author of Wide Awake, The Forgotten Force That Elected Lincoln and Spurred the Civil War, is curator of political history at the National Museum of American History, the Smithsonian Institution. He's written three previous books about 19th century American politicians and vote, politics and voting. He has also written many scholarly articles and is a regular contributor to Smithsonian Magazine, to which some of you may subscribe. Yes, we do. John got his BA from Sarah Lawrence College in 2008, followed by a master's degree and a PhD in history from the University of Virginia. There you go. John will speak for about 30 minutes, leaving plenty of time for questions and discussion. His book shows that even though the election of 1860 has been written about endlessly, there are still things to be discovered about it. I'd like to welcome some of our former presidents who are with us tonight, Carolyn Quadarella, uh, Carolyn, uh, Karen Needles, immediate past president, David Kent, is John O'Brien on the call? No. Anyone else? Any other former presidentes? No. Okay, with that, John, I will share the screen with you. You have it up already? Um, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Take it away. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, I see it. I see it. I'm going to enter full screen. You can see the slideshow? No, not yet. <laughs> not yet, no. Not yet, no. Um, you can't see a slideshow now? Nope. Nope. All right, well, maybe there's another step I need to do to share my, what if I share side uh, screen first? Here, how about this? Yep. Yes, there now you got it. All right, there. Now yes. let me start the slideshow for Perfect. you. Thank you for your patience. There we go. Are we good? Yes, sir. Take it. Okay, thank you, Ed, and thank you all for coming today. I really appreciate you having a summer uh, session to discuss this. This guy, he's huh? booking. Everybody his mute themselves. Everybody <laughs> mute. Well, he can't can't stop. Stop. I'll be mute yourself. They said he he writes articles for the Smithsonian Magazine. Yeah. Mute everybody. Mute. There's a you know he's got. Are we class. mute? We got a line through this. All right, we need mute. Um, thank you all for coming today. Thank you, Ed, for organizing this. Um, I, I've heard about this group for years. It's always been like a a secret rumor about this amazing Lincoln group. So I'm really excited to speak to you today and be invited to to participate. Um. Usually when I speak about the Wide Awakes, the first question I ask of the audience is, have any of you heard of the Wide Awakes before? And, and in most cases, no one in the audience has. I think this might be a special audience where many of you have, but I'm going to start with the very basics and work from the general to the specifics. The Wide Awakes were a grassroots anti-slavery youth movement that you wore militaristic uniforms and held midnight rallies to campaign for Abraham Lincoln in 1860 election and to defend democracy against the threat they saw in slavery. They helped elect Abe Lincoln and they also helped to precipitate the Civil War. They were, I've really come to think, perhaps one of the largest, strangest, and most consequential mass political movements in American history. I've been studying the Wide Awakes for 17 years now, for, for quite some time, and I'm continuously surprised how we've forgotten their story, how obscure they are, and how little known they are. Because to me, the Wide Awakes are a key puzzle piece that helps explain three key questions that we have about the coming of the Civil War. 
First of all, the Wide Awakes help us understand how Abe Lincoln's campaign, the Republican campaign in 1860, was successful, how no previous anti-slavery movement was ever successful on a national or even re largely regional level of winning certainly the presidency until the Wide Awakes come along in 1860. Second of all, the Wide Awakes help us explain how the election of 1860 developed contiguously into the Civil War. This militaristic political movement helps us connect the dots from politics to war and from the events in September, October, November, 1860, all the way through till May, April, June, 1861. They, they jump and show that this is one political evolution rather than two separate events. And three, the Wide Awakes are a really useful device for asking where the line is between political speech and political violence, between mobilizing a movement and menacing one's fellow citizens, between standing up for what you think is right and going too far beyond certain norms in a democracy. I'm especially excited to speak to this group about the Wide Awakes because the Wide Awakes have a really unique relationship with Abe Lincoln and with Washington, D.C. Lincoln and D.C., or I'm sorry, Lincoln and the Wide Awakes were bonded almost from the very beginning. Their first official march, they escort Lincoln through the streets of Hartford and, and during uh, his tour after the Cooper Union speech. And they've been closely associated ever since. People really see them as twinned in a way that actually is in some ways we'll find to be a little bit exaggerated. Now the Wide Awakes in DC is a different story. The Wide Awakes were a predominantly Northern movement, but they did eventually develop a population in Washington DC. Uh, Kind of, are we okay on mute? Is everybody on mute right now? But it's also important for him. They are now, everyone's muted. Oh, John, you have to unmute yourself. So the Wide Awakes founded elsewhere eventually do emerge in Washington, D.C. and almost kind of peak in, in Washington, D.C. in interesting ways. The movement to elect Lincoln, the inauguration of Lincoln, and the early fighting of the Civil War are all tied between the Wide Awake movement and the city of Washington, D.C. So it's really exciting to talk to you about this. In fact, the city of Washington, you might say, is kind of a microcosm for the causes that create the Wide Awakes and lead to the Civil War. That Washington, D.C. is a perfect place to tell the story of this kind of the slave power maximalism that leads to the Civil War building over the 1850s. It is a city where the minority rule of slavery is most apparent. As, as we know, enslavers, slave owners, are just 2% of the population in 1860, 380,000 people. There are more citizens of New York City or Philadelphia than there are slave owners. Now, these enslavers are surrounded by family, by friends, by political alliances who support slavery, but really the number of people who are owning slaves in America is a significantly small population. And yet, when you look in DC, you see significant overrepresentation of enslavers at all levels of federal power. Five of the nine Supreme Court justices who decide the Dred Scott decision, you know, in 1857 are slave owners. Five of the nine, just like 2% of the nation. You see how disproportionate this is. The three-fifths clause means that there are 30 extra Southern seats in the House in the 1850s, key decisions, key roll call votes are decided by the dramatic overrepresentation of enslavers in Washington, D.C. Minority rule is most apparent in this city. And also, along with it, the other force with minority rule is the repression of free speech. That nowhere in, in America is the repression of free speech more obvious, maybe you could say, than the Capitol. Famously, events like the caning of Charles Sumner in 1857 and 69 other violent incidents between the 1830s and 1860s that take place in the capital area. Um, the vast majority of them suppressing anti-slavery speech. Anti-slavery congressmen like, like or senators like Charles Sumner, congressmen like Joshua Giddings are continuously engaged in repressive violence when they express, express criticism of slavery. Alexander Stevens, who becomes the vice president of the Confederacy famously says, I have no objection to liberty of speech when the liberty of the cudgel is left free to combat it. There's open public violence descending, dissenting against criticism of slavery, especially in Washington, DC. And also there's violence in the streets of DC outside of the Capitol. We, many of us know about the 1857 Know Nothing riots that go on in Washington, DC that are put down eventually by the Marines ordered by uh, James Buchanan in which I think it's 
eight rioters are killed. That's an engraving of it on the right there, which is get de gestures at this culture of public political violence that's building in the decades before the Civil War. This culture of mobbings that are common across the country, but particularly dramatic in DC, in Baltimore, in Philadelphia, in a number of cities. There were 1,218 mobbings during this period between 1828 and 1861. Now, they didn't all persecute anti-slavery voices, but the largest amount were persecuted abolitionists, anti-slavery uh, voices, African-American communities, and the growing Republican Party. So Washington, D.C. is kind of the fighting ground where what's at stake is most clear. The sense that slavery is threatening majority rule and threatening free speech and imposing itself on American democracy. This is the soil from which the wide awakes emerge. Now, there's certainly people pushing back against this. You have abolitionists growing more and more aggressive in places like Boston. Certainly, John Brown's activities throughout the 1850s show a, a rising level and the, the Republican Party is coalescing to fight back against the slave power. In 1856, the previous presidential election, they win 33% of the electoral vote. They win basically the upper north. But this lower north where mobbing is most prominent and the future of the nation is to be decided is still up in the air. And so the movement that eventually rises up kind of to decide this force does not take place in Boston or DC or Kansas frontier, but in Hartford, Connecticut, one of the most mild, prosperous, orderly cities in America at the time. Connecticut is one of the wealthiest states in America, the, the wealthiest state outside of the South per capita in 1860. It has the highest literacy rates. And, and you might be surprised to see that this movement gets started in Hartford, Connecticut. But Connecticut is still a doubtful state at this point. It's in New England. It's leaning Republican. But in Hartford, five of the last six mayors have been Democrats. Sam Colt, Samuel Colt, the arms manufacturer, is a prominent conservative Democrat in Hartford, Connecticut. There are still mobbings in the streets going on. When Republicans attempt to hold a demonstration in the 1856 election in Hartford, they are attacked by shot with fireworks and, and set upon. And so in 1860, as the 1860 election opens, the Republicans in Hartford, Connecticut, decide to make a public statement by inviting to kick off their gubernatorial election that spring, Cassius M. Clay. Many of you might be familiar with Cassius Clay because he's such a prominent figure. Um, he's kind of perhaps the best representative of fighting for free speech that you can find in America. The anti-slavery Kentuckian printer, politician, speaker, who has shed blood, his own and others, in defense of the ability to criticize slavery. In Hartford, Connecticut, in, 19, in 1860, February 28th, the Republicans hold a nighttime rally. Clay will speak on the subject of free speech, and afterwards there'll be a torchlit campaign or a torchlit march. Across the street from the speaking venue is a textile store called Talcott and Post Textile Company. There are five clerks working there. One of them is 19-year-old Edgar Jurgensen. You've seen pictured over there on the top left. Jurgensen has a reputation for being fastidious about his clothing, and he doesn't want the oil from the torches from the march to ruin his new coat. So he gets a length of waterproof fabric and sews it into a makeshift cape. He's a skilled sewer because he works as a clerk in a textile store. Throws his cape over his shoulders and makes a torch with a torch top and a long curtain rod. And the four fellow clerks working with him do the same. So that when Clay wraps up his speech into the Connecticut the night in February, all these people walk out to see these five young men in these kind of pseudo militaristic capes with long torches in the night. Republicans immediately see the strength of this model and the kind of dynamism and, and strength that it demonstrates. And they put these five young clerks at the front of their march through Hartford. Now that march is attacked by Democrats that night. And there's a fight ensues over the torches, which Edgar Jurgensen's friends win. They defend the torches. This model, this uniform, this kind of momentum among young people and this victorious fight to defend public criticism of slavery in the streets gives young people in Hartford an, an idea. And one week later, they meet. 36 of them, including Edgar Jurgensen, young clerks who work in downtown Hartford, mostly working class guys, 19, 20, 21, the oldest are in their mid twenties at this point, meet above a bank in one of their apartments and they organize a movement. First, they decide on the name to call themselves the Wide Awakes. There are three meanings in the, built into the name Wide Awake. First. Just that week, a Republican editor for the Hartford Current 
said Republicans are wide awake in 1860 in an article. And the movement that emerges has a really strong relationship with newspaper editors. So they borrow their name in part from that club, or from that article. The second thing is that across the 1850s, wide awake is a popular expression to mean politically alert and engaged. A little bit like woke, but not necessarily with leftist connotations. Anybody can be wide awake. It just means alert, engaged in politics, standing up for yourself in public life. But there's a third meaning for wide awake. Across the 1850s, wide awake clubs were nativist anti-immigrant clubs, particularly anti-Catholic clubs in Brooklyn, in Boston, up and down the East Coast, even in Hartford. And when these young men, all of them native born Protestants, name their organization the Wide Awakes, they see a connection. They are aware of the connection back to this nativist movement. So there's a, there's a strong irony that this movement that eventually helps go on to kill slavery grows from xenophobia and intolerance in, in its origins in the 1850s. They organize, they have a name, they elect leaders that night, and they choose a uniform. They get kind of fancier capes than the one Eddie Yergeson had sewn, and they choose martial kepis, caps. And they begin to use militarism as a key political message. Not only is it striking and dynamic, but it signals the orderliness that they're trying to project. They march to military drills, which they get from Hardy's drill books. They march usually in silence with some cheering. They get project, they march in ranks in the street. They project a sense of order, of stability in a world that looks like democracy is falling into chaos. They are really trying to project the sense of ma masculine, muscular orderliness in a democracy that seems like it's going in the opposite direction. And they have the good luck in their first march to escort Abraham Lincoln, who is traveling through New England after the Cooper Union speech. He goes to Hartford. He gives basically the same speech that he'd been given all week. Um, he said all his best ideas already in the papers, but he gives a speech to a rousing crowd of about a thousand people, and he steps out for his carriage ride back to his hotel. And out of the crowd emerge, it's about, it's more than 36, somewhere between 36 and 50 wide awakes in capes, with torches, with uniforms, with hats, who escort him down the darkened streets of Hartford. We don't know what Lincoln thought of this at the time. We don't know if this was something that had been explained to him, if it was mysterious, but it sure is striking and compelling. And it's it's just damn good luck that this movement's first person they escort goes on to be elected president within the year. I think it's a really striking uh, story there. The movement doesn't just impress Lincoln, it impresses people throughout Connecticut. You can see wide awake companies bubbling up across the state in Waterbury, in New Haven, in Bristol, starting to spread as kind of a cellular movement. And they often work as escorts for anti-slavery speakers. They're often engaged in violence in the streets and they find a clever way of weaponizing that violence. Whenever they lose a fight, they broadcast it. For instance, in New Haven, there's an, a march to a big event of Wide Awakes in New Haven and Democrats turn out and stone them and throw bricks at them and injure 11 of them. In, instead of slinking off, those 11 are put on the stage at the event behind the speaker in their uniforms with blood dripping from their injuries as a way to broadcast their grievance, the repression of their views and, and state that they're not backing down. Now this kind of um, public, almost propagandistic use of the, the violence against them really catches the attention of Republicans across the North, particularly in Chicago. The wide awakes are exploding in, in, in Hartford and across Connecticut and, and a little bit in New England in spring 1860, Chicago is going to host the Republican National Convention in mid-May, and they know that they want to promote their city. So re young Republicans in Chicago start, without ever having met a Connecticut wide awake, to build their own model of clubs. They read about them in the newspapers, they get literature from Hartford, and they form organizations, not just in Chicago, but all throughout Wisconsin, Iowa, way down into to the little Egypt in, in lower Illinois, so that by the time the RNC begins in May 1860, there are thousands of wide awakes in the streets of Chicago. And when delegates come from Pennsylvania and Maine and Iowa and all over the North for the Republican convention, they're introduced to this wide awake movement. They try on wide awake capes at the textile stores. Wide awakes guard the wigwam from you know rowdies and street troublemakers. And the whole Republican North is introduced to this mass movement, this kind of Connecticut import. Now, Lincoln is famously not at the convention in Chicago, as nominees usually weren't. And he's famously somewhat of a 
dark horse nominee without too much campaign apparatus in place when he gets the nomination. Obviously, he has friends in Illinois, but unlike Seward, who had an organization throughout the Northeast, Lincoln doesn't have, on in the middle of May, a national campaign organization, but the wide awakes do. And because Lincoln is young and youthful and of laboring origin, he kind of converges with the associations and the groups most popular for the wide awakes. So when Lincoln is nominated, the wide awakes start to pop up all throughout the North. Delegates go home to Pennsylvania and to Maine and to New York State and to California and form wide awake organizations. We can see hundreds of them formed in just the week after the convention closes. And it really begins this incredible race to form wide awake clubs throughout the North. The summer of 1860, we see wide awake clubs forming in every Northern state, every, uh, most Western states, into the upper South a little bit. They're spread through the newspapers. Editors say, name check a town nearby and say, hey, why don't you start a wide awake club? Or they'll reference a nearby wide awake club and say, young men of our town, can you form a club? The Hartford Originals, really young guys, people who had never voted in a presidential election before, start printing up literature to promote the Wide Awakes nationwide. They um, they print up uh, fill in the blank forms to help people learn how to be a Wide Awake so that people in Healdsburg, California, in the woods of Northern California are forming Wide Awake clubs not too long after they've gotten started on the East Coast. The numbers are really striking. But by the end of summer 1860, most Americans believe there are half a million wide awakes in the nation, in a nation of 31 million. I think that number is inflated. I don't think we should believe the number 500,000. I think maybe 100,000 or a quarter million is more accurate. But the national perception of a 500,000 person movement, which would be the equivalent of a 5 million person movement today, is really taking the country by hold and convinces people all across the nation that there are 500,000 wide awakes, that one in every 62 Americans is a member of this movement. It's really one of the larger mass political membership movements in our history, rivaling the Know Nothings in the 1850s, the second KKK in the 1920s, Black Lives Matter uh, more recently. It's certainly larger than things like the Proud Boys or, or the Black Panthers or, or other organizations. And because they have memberships, we, we, we get a sense of the incredible scale. It's also a strikingly diverse movement. It really spans class incredibly well. Most of these guys are working class. Some are elites. It also spans backgrounds. Immigrants start to join in large numbers, primarily Protestant immigrants in the lower uh, Midwest, in places like Illinois, Indiana, Missouri, German uh, wide awake companies are formed, Scandinavian wide awake companies are formed, and it really is popular among that population. At the same time, former know nothings, na nativists from the American party are also joining wide awake clubs in Pennsylvania, in Baltimore, and throughout primarily the, the southern mid Atlantic. So, this same movement is incorporating at the same time immigrants and anti immigrants. It's incorporating radical abolitionists and basically conservatives. It's really spreading across an incredible breadth of the populations with which the Republicans were weakest in the last election. Young people, working class people in the lower north, immigrants, nativists, these populations that are going to be key in the 1860 election are flocking to the wide awakes. Now the movement presents a challenge to Republican leadership. Republicans find wide awakes outside their houses in the middle of the night with oompa bands and torches to serenade them and to, to toast them. And it's it's annoying to some of them. There are all these incredible accounts of William Henry Seward, for instance, basically sticking his head out the window and saying, let me sleep, I'll speak to you tomorrow morning, because they just show up at his house and they particularly like Seward and Seward learns to deal well with the wide awakes. But William Seward also really liked his sleep. He was, he was a drinker and a smoker and enjoyed a good night's sleep afterwards. And the wide awakes came around two in the morning and woke him up. Carl Schurz complains about the same thing. It's not easy to be the leader of a political party at the national level and figure out how to coalesce with 19 year olds who have never voted in a campaign before, but have enthusiasm and energy. Um, Lincoln struggles with this probably more than anyone, because as you know, Lincoln is not campaigning as was the custom at the time. He said he has a taste in his mouth a little, but he refrains. He stays in Springfield. 
but he's getting regularly letters from wide awakes, making him an honorary wide awake in Chicago, inviting him to rallies in, in Buffalo and in upstate New York, uh, giving him unsolicited advice on how to campaign. Who are these 19 year olds writing to the nominee of a major party telling him how to run his election? There's, there's an element of a chutzpah to the wide awakes, an energy that is, is really striking. The moment when Lincoln and the wide awakes overlapped the most that summer is the August 8th rally in Springfield, this famous rally when tens of thousands of people come to Springfield to celebrate Lincoln, to march around his house. Many of them are brought by the wide awakes. There is a Springfield wide awake secretary who's in charge of correspondence, Louis D. Rosette. He's a guy in his 20s. He's a basically a failing lawyer but he gets extremely excited about the wide awakes and he starts sending invitations to, for this event across Illinois, uh, into Wisconsin, to Missourians, to Indianans, to people in Ohio, and tens of thousands of people come to this event. Many of them come as wide awake companies in excursion trains. They sleep under their capes at night. We don't know, estimates are run range from 18,000 at that event to 80,000 at that event. But Springfield had fewer than 10,000 residents at the time. So this is a city inundated with wide awake visitors and other supporters of Abraham Lincoln. Um, the movement begins to expand even into the South. The Republican party is largely a sectional party and doesn't have too much Southern support, but you see wide awake clubs emerging in Baltimore, in St. Louis, in Wheeling, in Wilmington, in cities that were in the South at the time that maintained slavery and suppressed anti-slavery criticism very violently. Most interestingly in DC, the wide awakes in DC become an active, engaged public presence. Uh, Washington has a large population of Northerners, obviously people, clerks, appointees who are in town who begin to join up with this movement as well as many Southerners who are frustrated with the dominance of slavery over their society. There's a, there was a wide awake wigwam at second and it's now East Street. It was Indiana at the time. Um, a multiple story one, Lewis Cleffin, it becomes the head of the Washington Wide Awakes. He's an abolitionist printer who actually printed Uncle Tom's Cabin in the 1850s and leads the Wide Awakes and famously writes to Lincoln, sends him a box of grapes from Virginia and a message that it's not a bomb, it's a, a note of admiration, and that he is helping to print ballots to get Lincoln, you know, votes for Lincoln in Maryland and Virginia. Um, so there are Southern Wide Awakes. And by October 1860, there are also African-American wide awakes in Oberlin, in Boston, in Portland, Maine, African-American wide awake clubs form. John Mercer Langston, the Reconstruction era congressman, is, I think, the first black wide awake in Oberlin. Fugitive slave leaders like Lewis Hayden organized the West Boston uh, African or colored wide awakes uh, in, in that era. Now, this movement is incredibly exciting to its supporters, and it's incredibly frustrating and menacing to its opponents. Northern Democrats argue that the wide awakes are breaking dangerous precedents in a democracy, that by evoking militarism, by marching uh, in uniform, by, by kind of seeming like a militaristic threat, Democrats argue that the wide awakes are stepping over a boundary that can't be stepped over, that they're going to begin a spiral into political violence and our elections will become pitched battles. And they're not wrong to argue this. There is no precedence for this level of militarism in American democracy. And it is legitimately concerning to see marchers with torches in the night for a political party. The question of where the boundaries are is an open one. But Democrats at the same time and the Bell Everett supporters form their own offsets to the wide awake, they call them. They form clubs, march through towns. And their clubs are interesting. They're noticeably more disorganized less orderly, less uniform. They don't strike the same evocative model that the wide awakes are so skilled at striking. And that tells us a lot about a political party that's crumbling. Now in the South, the view of the wide awakes is more hysterical. Newspapers throughout the South by September, October, 1860 are reporting that the wide awakes are in fact a paramilitary force, that they're arming, that they are organizing to invade the South perhaps after the uh, election, perhaps for the inauguration, that they are a violent movement beginning the, to coerce the South. Uh, and people form in the South offset clubs of their own. The Minutemen in Charleston and in St. Louis form specifically to fight the wide awakes or as an offset to the wide awakes. 
in Washington, D.C., and in Baltimore, you get this movement called the National Volunteers, which are mostly elite Southern Democrats who march in uniforms, demonstrate in the streets, and specifically say, we're here to stop the wide awakes from coming south. A large number, it turns out, of the Capitol Police officers are memberships of the National Volunteers, which is very concerning to many people. When the election finally takes place in November, the Republicans win. Lincoln wins 39.8% of the popular vote, 59% of the electoral vote. And it's always been a question of what impact the wide awakes have on this outcome. It's certainly the case that the parts of the country where the Republicans gain the most, they do the best over 1856 in places like Indiana, Ohio, Illinois, Pennsylvania, and uh, California in the lower north, and among younger voters and newer voters who were the wide awake strength. And the, wherever the wide awakes are strongest, we do see the greatest gains for the Republican Party. That We don't know, have a full list of who the wide awakes were, so we can't ever connect all the evidence. But I think there's a strong argument to be made that the wide awake momentum and enthusiasm helps elect Lincoln. Even more importantly, the wide awakes flavor the outcome and impact the takeaway of that election. Because they were so prominent, because they were so striking, many people come out of the 1860 election believing not just that this relatively quiet man in Illinois was elected, but that this mass movement across the country has gained power. This is uh, Horace Greeley says as much in, in the New York Tribune. He says the first cause of the election was a split in the Democratic Party. And the second is the wide awake movement, that they embodied the Republican cause, that they kind of made material the feelings a lot of people had had intellectually for quite some time. Now, on election night, those national volunteers I discussed, the anti-wide awakes in, Democrat, uh, in Washington, D.C., set upon the wide awake wigwam in Washington, D.C. Lewis Cleffin writes later this account of being on the downstairs floor of the building when this mob attacks. And they're celebrating, they're smoking cigars. They go up to the second floor as the mob ransacks the first floor. And they listen as the, the printing press is destroyed, as the wide awake capes are being torn. And eventually they find themselves on the roof on election night, holding bricks in case someone comes up after them, listening to voices below calling to burn down the building. Now, the police ultimately disperse that crowd, but it's a telling moment. This is an electro electoral movement that printed ballots that helped the Lincoln win election, and yet they can't command the streets. There's still this growing sense of public political menace in America, regardless of who wins this election. Now, as you know, the movement for secession begins immediately in November, that states like uh, South Carolina, Louisiana, and Georgia allocate money for defense. South Carolina expels federal employees and free African Americans, calls back politicians from Washington, D.C., begins uh, secession conventions. And everywhere you see lobbying for secession, you often see the wide awakes invoked even after the election as a kind of boogeyman to scare people out of the union. As the secession com uh, commissioners go north into the mid and upper south, they often make the case that the wide awakes are coming, that you can't stay in the union because of the wide awakes, because democracy has already been broken by the north, by the Republicans. Henry Wise, the former uh, governor of Virginia, says the wide awakes are coming to cut them all to pieces and planning a, a marine invasion of Norfolk. Uh, Benning, who also goes up from Georgia to, to convince Virginians to secede, says the wide awakes are plotting to start a race war in Virginia and invade as it unfolds. The wide awakes are a useful crowbar to try to leverage Southerners out of the Union. And while there certainly would have been secession either way, I think you can make a strong case that the number of Southerners who ultimately support secession is impacted by fear of the wide awakes. They're really common in the newspapers during this period. It's also an open question what the wide awakes themselves should do after the election. Political campaign clubs usually disband on election day. That's the standard uh, norms for the era. But it seems like a civil war is breaking out in America. And the Republicans have hundreds of thousands of uniformed, trained, aggressive young men who could help fight that civil war should one break out. So there are voices calling to militarize the wide awakes, to arm the wide awakes. A lot of this begins to focus in on Lincoln's inauguration. There are credible uh, stories and claims that Lincoln will be assassinated on his way to the inauguration. 
or at his inauguration, perhaps in Maryland. And people begin to write Lincoln and his friends that the wide awake should go with him, that they could have 5,000, 100,000 armed or plainclothes wide awakes go as a military escort, almost how Mussolini went to the Capitol in, uh, with, with the black shirts. Um, people write plots to defend Lincoln. It's coming from a lot of different places. But Lincoln is pretty clear that the Wide Awakes are a campaign organization. He thanks them for their efforts through November, but essentially leads them to believe that they ended in November. And it's put out through his surrogates that the Wide Awakes should not go to the inauguration. John Hay, his secretary, tells Springfield Wide Awakes not to go to Washington, D.C. William uh, Wood, who organizes Lincoln's trip east to Washington, D.C., uh, publishes notices in newspapers telling Wide Awakes not to converge whenever he comes through town. They, they still show up because they're so excited about him. And William Seward tells Wide Awakes to disband, to go home, and let the politicians handle the crisis. When they are planning the inauguration, when, once Lincoln is in D.C., Winfield Scott, famous general, is arguing that the inauguration should be private to protect Lincoln's security. And Wide Awake, Lewis Cleffin, the D.C. leader of the Wide Awakes, argues that it has to be a public inauguration, that the entire campaign was in some ways dependent on the idea to publicly express these views, and it can't be done behind closed doors. Winfield Scott tells Clefane that his number one condition for doing a public inauguration is that there not be wide awakes present. There are still wide awakes in the crowd on the, uh, for the inauguration. There are large numbers of them in plain clothes, wearing badges, some bring cap covers, and after Lincoln gives his inaugural, they put their caps back on to show that they were present all along. 364 days after the Wide Awakes escort Lincoln through Hartford, he's escorted down Pennsylvania Avenue and begins his presidency peacefully. But elsewhere, the Wide Awakes are arming. In St. Louis, the Wide Awakes are famously armed there by Francis Preston Blair and Nathaniel Land into a paramilitary club. They become, in short order, they go from a partisan political movement that has no weapons to a private anonymous uh, uh, campaign club or militaristic club with carbines, with rifles that are eventually turned into the U.S. reserves. As the war begins, as Fort Sumter is fired upon, these wide awakes and their um, opponents, their offsets, are on the ground in the first bloodshed of the Civil War. Famously, the Pratt Street riot in Baltimore is the first real bloodshed of the Civil War. Rioting, attacks by, by Democrats in Baltimore against federal troops, Massachusetts troops moving through Baltimore in April 1861. This mob that attacks the federal troops is led by national volunteers who have organized originally to fight the wide awakes and set upon these Massachusetts troops. On the other side, in St. Louis, the wide awakes turned paramilitary force called the U.S. Reserves now um, attacks the proto-Confederate force at Camp Jackson and kills 30 people in, in, the, in the ensuing violence. Wherever bloodshed begins in the Civil War, in Baltimore, in St. Louis, it's fought by the wide awakes and their enemies, and it looks more like the mobbing and public violence, uh, politics in the streets that had been building for generations. It looks more like that than it looks like Gettysburg or, or Bull Run or anything. Uh, this era that peaks with the wide awakes leads to the Civil War. Uh, and also in Washington, D.C. itself, when there's fear that Washington will be surrounded, that the national capital will be overrun in the early weeks of the Civil War, the defense is organized by Cassius M. Clay from the beginning. Um, and he organizes what's called the Clay's Guards, Clay's Brigades, the Strangers Guards, and many of the people in his volunteer defense of Washington are wide awakes. Many wide awakes went to Washington, D.C. after the inauguration to seek patronage for their hard work. And prominent wide awakes from Hartford, from New York, from uh, across America sign up, march in the streets with carbines to defend Washington, D.C. with Cassius Clay. They, no one fires a sh shot. They're not actually used, but these are the people on the ground. At the same time, the wide awakes are among the first people to enlist in the war in the Union Army. In April, in May, in June 1861, whole wide awake companies in towns so enlist to fight. Captains of wide awake companies often become officers leading military companies. Uh, of the Hartford wide awakes, four of the five original wide awakes fight in the war. The great majority of the P-36 who form the wide awakes fight in the war. 
overall, about half of military age Northern men fight in the Civil War at some point. I'd say, and this is purely anecdotal, I think it's something like three quarters or maybe even 80% of the wide awake sources I've found fought in the Union Army at one point or another. It really is, and particularly early in the war. These are early enlistees, which, which makes sense. Um, after the war, the nation that the, is inherited is kind of dominated by the types of people who supported the wide awakes. These, this generation coming of age right around the Civil War in Connecticut, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, these are the people who become the Gilded Age Republicans. Five of the nine presidents from the, for the rest of the century are either have been members of wide awake companies like Benjamin Harrison or trained wide awakes like Ulysses S. Grant or spoke to wide awake clubs like many of the other Republican presidents. Their former wide awakes were senators, congressmen, governors, uh, secretaries of the interior, vice presidents threaded throughout Gilded Age America are former wide awakes who are excited about their, their service. In fact, Edgar Jurgensen, that 19 year old who designed the first cape goes on to become a prominent interior designer and redecorates the White House in the 1890s. Uh, he's the one who electrifies the White House and gives it the first electric lighting in the White House. The same person who in 1860 designed the cape and torch for the wide awakes, 30 years later redesigns the White House and shows a continuous engagement in public material politics in America. Uh, over time, the wide awakes came to seem kind of old hat. This uh, on the on the left is the original wide awakes. On the right is a 1914 photograph of George P. Holt, who um, was a wide awake in 1860 and continued to march in his cape for quite some time. And over the 20th century, they were mostly forgotten. In 2017, the Smithsonian was lucky enough to collect George P. Holt's cape. If you look at the cape on the man on the right, and you look at this cape and torch there, those were discovered in an attic in New Hampshire, and we were lucky enough to collect those for the Smithsonian. It, it sparks a question to me, why was this movement forgotten? Why is it so obscure to people today? I think there are a number of reasons. One was military service right afterwards in the Civil War was a larger and more overwhelming experience for most people. It, it simply more significant in their identity, that they fought in the Union Army, that they saw combat than the club they were in the year before. But I also think the wide awakes tell a story of how the war came that is makes Americans a little bit uncomfortable. The, this mass movement that is standing up against slavery is also engaging in democracy in some of the most ominous ways, bordering the line between politics and paramilitary organizations, between politics and violence. And so I think it's been easier over the years to forget the wide awakes because the story they tell us about our own nation, about our own democracy is somewhat troubling. The wide awakes are admirable and crucial and troubling all at once. And I think the more I learn about them, the more I, and the more we watch our politics unfold today, the more we can see both why they were so compelling in 1860 and why they were so menacing at the same time. I um. I would be happy to discuss this topic and, and take any questions you have. All right, we already have several questions coming in. We have till, I booked until about 8.30. Uh, Jim Ostroff asks, to what extent did the success of the wide awake movement and the rallies in the 1860 and 64 elections affect US politics in the year after the Civil War? You mentioned that several presidents were involved with the wide awakes, but did the Republicans continue to have these torchlight parades and the Democrats uh, adopt the same tactic? Yeah, it becomes the model for how to run a campaign from the wide awakes until really 1904 or 1900. The way you run a campaign in most of America, excuse me, is with torchlight marches, with militaristic uniforms. If you you look at that torch in the corner image right there, the one leaning against the wall. We, we won't be able to see it. It's too small. But George Holt, the wide awake who used that torch, used it in every Republican campaign from 1860 through 1904 and marked almost like a fighter jet, marked in 1860, 1864, 1868, marked every presidential election he marched in. This was the dominant way you ran a campaign, was public political events, torchlit marches, uniforms, 
it, it goes out of fashion in the 20th century, but it's really how you campaigned for the 60 years or so, or maybe the, the 50 years or so after the Wide Awakes. I should add that uh, I sent John the video in 1960. The Chicago Democratic Machine continued having torchlight parades for FDR and Harry Truman and uh, and uh, uh, on and on. And the famous video from 1960 of the torchlight parade for John Kennedy. People in Chicago were really literally hysterical for Kennedy, they were the Catholic candidate. And in 1976, I attended what I think is the last of them was for Jimmy Carter. I saw it on the, the Michigan Avenue Bridge. Was it the last torch just before the first Mayor Daley died? Uh, Carl Adams has his hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, I want uh, to let you know, my uh, great-great-grandfather was a member of the Wide Awakes in Western Illinois. They had you know that? as a farmer in the land between the rivers, between the southern end of the Illinois River and the Mississippi River. And uh, at about the same time, a uh, granddaughter was going to have a baby. That baby was named Lincoln Abraham Adams in 1861. But unfortunately, he died uh, at the age of eight. Well, I have a picture of him in the family archives. And I read about the, uh, uh, his connection to the Wide Awakes. Uh, the Lincoln Abraham Adams died at the age of eight. So I've got a picture of him in the family archives, and I've got references that he was a member of the Wide Awakes in the 1860-1861, and he was from Jersey County, which was the first uh, anti-slavery, one of the first anti-slavery societies in the state of Illinois in the 1830s. And so my heritage and all that goes, goes way back, but the, yeah. uh, the Adams that would have fought in the... Uh, American Civil War was named John Quincy Adams, and he died at the age of 17 in November of 1861. Let me ask. So after they lost, after they lost the son, grandson in November of 1861, they didn't particularly want to lose anymore. Carl, yeah. let me ask if let me ask if uh, anyone else on the call had uh, ancestors who were wide awakes that you know of. Did sure, you? I'll take my hand down. Yeah, but I mean, does anyone else have wide awake uh, ancestors? If you do, mention it in the chat. It's uh, unusual, but it was there. David, yeah, I'm, it's impressive. Go ahead, that you, David. Well, well, one moment. It's impressive that you know that. Um, I, I'm really, I'd love to know if you have any uh, records for his his participation in the wide awakes. Illinois is, after Connecticut, the most wide awake part of America. And there are, if you read the Tribune from the summer of 1860, there are rallies in central Illinois every other day basically there are thousands of people on the march across the really small towns through central illinois it's amazing how wide awake and how excited this this part of the country was yeah well since this is being recorded uh uh my email is carlmadams6 at gmail.com i'll be more than happy to send you what i've got and i did That's find it very interesting but there just wasn't very much of it and unfortunately lincoln abraham adams died at the age of eight mm -hmm even though he was born in 1860, 61, somewhere in there. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the, the heritage is there and it's documented, uh, but uh, we'll have to exchange that in emails because I don't have it handy. All right. David sure. Kent has a question. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, um, I'm, I've been researching a little bit about Lincoln and, and New England, Hartford. So that's where I first came across the uh, Wide Awakes. And uh, but your book really, really filled in a lot of information I didn't I didn't know about them. Um, I have one question. Uh, you mentioned tonight and you mentioned in your book that, you know, when Lincoln first came across them, it was because they just showed up like right after the day after, I guess, they officially formed the wide awakes and a few days or a week, whatever it was, after they had escorted Cassius Clay. Um, Lincoln had met Cassius Clay on the, on the train on the way there. Uh, and he, I think from what you've said that he, Lincoln was like, well, this is interesting. You know, <laughs> who are these people? And that's about it. And there wasn't much interaction. But later on, and you talk in detail in the book about uh, different interactions, letters that people sent to Lincoln and that Lincoln or Lincoln surrogates sent to uh, different wide awake type uh, people or or groups. 
you know, I got the impression from what you're writing that, you know, because Lincoln wasn't actually campaigning, he didn't have a lot of interaction with Wide Awake, so he wouldn't have been out there where they were uh, escorting and demonstrating and doing all this noise that keeps people like William Seward up. Uh, but he seemed, from what you wrote, he seemed, Lincoln seemed to basically want to kind of keep them in the background and not uh, not give them too much emphasis because he was afraid of, I guess, this darker side of things that you were you're talking about. Can you can you talk a little bit about that? Well, it, it's funny because over the years, Lincoln and the Wide Awakes have become a shared story, and people make him the leader of the Wide Awakes, the founder of the Wide Awakes. You know, the uh, the Hay and Nicolay account has Lincoln as kind of starting this movement. Um, He's not on record anywhere saying anything negative about the Wide Awakes. He only says nice things, supportive things. He sends a letter to the Wide Awakes after his victory, thanking them for their participation. I, and I think that he probably was happy to have this movement. It, it kind of confirmed what he was saying, the salience of it with, with this rising generation. But he does, at other times, uh, talk about the value of you know counting noses and really running a ground campaign the way campaigns are usually won in the 19th century, which is talking to people, leaning on people, convincing voters. And he does say he thinks the kind of big public parades, rallies are a little silly and besides the point. I also think that the absence of major writing about the wide awake, considering this mass movement is going on, it is striking in itself. I mean, all the other Republican leaders are on record writing extensively about the wide awake. Seward, Carl Schurz, uh, Lovejoy, across the board, the, the Adams family, you can find a lot of accounts, but Lincoln doesn't write that much about them. I don't think he dislikes the movement. I don't think he's hostile to it, but I don't think he, and there's no evidence. So this is the absence of evidence here, but I think he's, I get the sense he's a little bit weary of them, but I, I couldn't put a, put a finger on a quote where he says the wide awake should go away now except that he after he's won, won his election he treats them as a movement that is done he treats them as a movement from essentially may to november uh he thanks them he he jokes around with them a little bit when he's coming to dc he stops in philadelphia for a speech and there are a lot of wide awakes in the crowd and he he jokes about the letters he gets from wide awakes uh so i don't think he was opposed but i he's not excited i mean people like william seward carl Schurz fall in love with this movement and think it's the future and, and Lincoln not not as much I think Thank I you. think, I think you know said that Carl you, Hay John. was uh, actually telling them we would rather you didn't show up at the inauguration yes. yeah yes yeah. Um, the new guy wide awakes new now wait a minute <laughs> we have more the, questions um, we have more questions the guy we have more questions hold on okay Craig Howell do you asked, want me to respond to that or Craig Howell asks, what was the relationship between the pl plug uglies of Baltimore and D.C., who are generally know-nothings, focused against immigrants and Catholics and the offsets? This is a great question. It's so complicated because you have this large American party in the 1850s, these know-nothing clubs, and they overlap in places with the white awakes. And in the, in the more northern parts, these white Anglo-Saxon Protestant nativists in Hartford and Boston, in New York, throughout the North, generally lean Republican over time. Like the, by, by 1860, there really isn't a viable know-nothing movement left. They, they've been subsumed into the Republican Party, and the Republicans have been a good job stamping out the nativism. They take this demographic, and people like um, Henry Wilson, like, um, like William Seward, like Abe Lincoln, denounce the xenophobia of the movement. But take those voters, basically, in places like Baltimore, where a lot of people are more hostile to anti-slavery movements in southern cities, where there are a lot of know nothings, you have a more complicated dynamic because they're not most of them going to become Republican, but they still hate the Democrats. So so you have this third force. And when fighting breaks out in Baltimore in April 1861 with the Pratt Street riot, these know nothings kind of break and some of them support secession and some of them support the union. It, it's a tough decision for many of them to make, but the kind of street level political violence that you see and the factionalism that you see definitely feeds the wide awakes 
certainly in, in places like Hartford, where there is a connection between these nativist clubs and the young men who start the wide awakes. I think they essentially drop the nativism as their primary motivation and segue to anti-slavery. And if you think about it, both are based in some way on a conspiratorial cast of mind. That 1850s nativism is primarily based on the idea that the Catholic Church is conspiring against America. They're most hostile to Catholics. And there's this idea that, that Catholicism and the Pope are conspiring against American democracy. A lot of these guys sub this out for a new conspiracy that is much more accurate, that the slave power is conspiring against American democracy. And so they, they do manage to jump from one movement to another. And I think it's fair to say from one movement that is uh, dishonorable to one that is more honorable. It's interesting to see that switch. Okay, you got a question from Buffalo, New York. Ethan Afshani. Ethan, unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, and I thought to ask, because it was in the news lately, that because I'm from uh, Buffalo area, I'm from Williamsville, uh, you know, which is on the outskirts of Buffalo. But uh, there's a town near me called Clarence. And recently, a Wide Awakes uh, banner sold because it was deassessed from a, uh, a museum a historical society and it's a beautiful piece um and it was for uh i think it sold for forty thousand dollars so i wow. could snag that but thought i'd share that in case you didn't see it because it's a really cool piece ethan do other i've not seen that one do other pieces from the wide awakes come up in auctions ethan's a young lincoln Lincolnia collector I haven't seen that many. I know a, a friend of mine, I think he had a, a tintype of a of a supporter. And uh but I'd I say, think I'd say every year or so a banner comes up for sale somewhere. There was one for sale last year, another the year before. I haven't seen the Clarence one I have to check it out. Um Buffalo is after Connecticut and after the Berkshires, the third big place where wide awakes blow up. Um, so I'd love to see it. it, it it's really interesting. Um, some of these banners are amazingly well preserved and go for a lot of money, as you, you say. There, there are collectors out there who are willing to spend significant amounts of money on a well preserved banner. Frank Gorman from Baltimore, another city that plays a lot in this story, asks: Other than Edgar Jurgensen, do you know the names of leaders and/or prominent persons? who were wide awakes between 1865 to 1920. I guess he means besides those who were presidents. How many members of Congress, for instance, and governors were wide awakes? Oh, I wrote it down once. Um, Connecticut, Illinois, Ohio. I think I'll had senators who were wide awakes. Um, Secretary of Interior was a wide awake. Um, and, and you know what? You see it almost more on a slightly lower level the people who are city commissioners who run to large organizations uh throughout the north many of them were wide awake it's kind of like having all gone been in the same fraternity and if you think about gilded age america a really significant majority of the people who are in positions of power are northern republicans who fought in the civil war i mean think of your late 19th century president or politician this is kind of union vets from Ohio and, and from New York State, they're exactly the demographic who were also wide awake. So there's a significant number of them. Some of them do quite well. The ones in Hartford make a lot of money, many of them in the insurance industry, and then spend that money holding reunions, buying old wide awake material. Um, Jurgensen himself becomes a collector. He owns not only the first wide awake cape, but he collects, among other things, famously the flag that was draped over Lincoln's, I believe his left shoulder when he's assassinated at Ford's Theater, he becomes a big collector. So they're, they're kind of threaded throughout prominent life in late 19th century America, Frank. Bonnie Harper has a question, unmute yourself. Thank you very much. I enjoyed your presentation. It was very interesting to me. Um, the question I have is, it was sort of colored by what you said at the beginning, that there was mobs, you know, mob violence happening everywhere. It's a very tense time. And it's kind of surprising to me that they could grow as a national organization, kind of be loosely connected with each other, I guess, through the states. So I wondered if there was a code of honor 
or some kind of pledge that that they made to to keep themselves presented as orderly and respectable and um, um, worthwhile? Yeah, it's a great question. They print constitutions. They're very formal. And in the way that 19th century joiners of organizations were often very formal, right? Like, so they print up constitutions, they elect leaderships. The constitutions usually say things like about respectable behavior, no improper behavior. You can't, you can't smoke cigars while marching. Some of them wouldn't drink. Um, they, they kind of commit themselves publicly to being re uh, responsible and being representing themselves well. There's a lot of fear that these young, mobilized, wide awakes are going to make the Republican Party look bad. And so I think they, they go out of their way to, to put on a good face. And another thing that's interesting is because they're so orderly and because they're fairly careful about this kind of thing, they have a really large appeal because of that. For, for instance, there are there are a few female wide awake companies in, in East Chatham, New York and at Mount Holyoke, but the audiences at wide awake events are often really populated with, with uh, women who are excited to go to a political event, who often support the Republican Party and like turning at an event where people aren't drinking and smoking and you know throwing bricks at each other. It, it, they build an ethos of public politics and engagement that seems responsible and civil and respectable. And, and that is really um, popular with a lot of Americans. As the campaign heats up, they devolve and you see more violence and you see more back and forth and, and um, bloodshed in the streets. But they're, they're pretty well behaved by the standards of 19th century American political organization. And I think having these constitutions, having this structure and having this cellular network. So wide awakes are not just representing their own community they write and engage with all these other wide awake companies. They do excursions to other towns. They have friendly rivalries with other wide awake companies, like who can recruit more members within a given period or, or who can have a more beautiful banner sewn by wide awake ladies or whatever. So they, they build this ethos that is pretty positive. It doesn't look that way to many Southerners and to many Democrats who think they're a paramilitary force, but on the ground, they're, they're not, particularly menacing. They, they do make an effort to behave well. Okay, John Willen has stayed wide awake during his presentation and he has a question. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, it's a, yeah, a comment that um, being a docent at the uh, Smithsonian American History, I don't know how you guys can see this, but if you want to see the wide awake uh, torches, we have a collection of the wide awake torches, which I'm showing here and this, and what it says on the top is hurrah for Lincoln. And it's when you come and do my tour, I often uh, take people to see the wide awake torches at the Smithsonian. Great. John, are you a docent in the democracy exhibit? I'm a docent, a highlights docent for the whole museum. Uh, I'll have to come down and say hi at some point. I'm sorry we haven't yeah, met yet. I've seen you. I've seen you. <laughs> Stop me next time. I... <laughs> <laughs> I've been there for like- Thank you for what so. you're doing. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I love Dal it. Okay. But Pat I do Dalby. show the wide awake torches. <laughs> Pat Dalby has a question. <clears throat> Unmute yourself, Pat. <laughs> no, Pat, are you there? John, I wanted to ask you, uh, Yeah. In, in after the war, the years of the Republican ascendancy when they controlled the presidency up until you know through Teddy Roosevelt, except for Grover Cleveland, did the Republican, did the Republican National Committee and the presidential campaigns, they wanted to make, did they want to make sure that there were no grassroots movements like this that they did not completely control? Because this is a very dangerous thing for a, a politician yes. and a national committee. This is the last thing they want is some independent freelancers running around. You know that is a great question. I would say the the campaign clubs after the war are slowly more top down and more run by state organizations um the, the sense the wide awakes of 1860 who start in warehouses and, and bar rooms and, and apartments the, the clubs after the war are more formal and more systematic and more structured but the whole political network back then is so diffuse that that doesn't that, that it's still pretty localized right i mean if you run a campaign in late 19th century America, you're running state campaigns that help run local campaigns that help run neighborhood campaigns. 
it's it's so spread out compared to what we're used to now that there's still a lot of on the ground organizing but um it is one of the things that ultimately is the cost that as you wear uniforms and need torches and need torch oil you need somebody to pay for all that and so political or, or elites and, and established leaders of the parties they can help fund them and they can give them speakers because these lectures are, are the, the the center of all these events they, they control the speakers and the money and that, so that's kind of how they help keep these guys in 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 check were the were they were they uh they were pro-union the, the in 1860 the white oaks were pro-union how widespread was abolition in abolitionism in the among the wide awakes what percentage of them were abolitionists would you say oh that's a good question you know i always wonder what percentage of americans were abolitionists and debate how many people were in 1860 i'd say the wide awakes they really run the spectrum. You have absolute ready to abolish slavery tomorrow abolitionists. And you have people like Frank Blair Jr., who was a former slave owner, who ends up supporting the Democratic Party later in his life. You, they really run the gamut. Um, a third are abolitionists, maybe a, a quarter. They, the other thing is the wide awakes are most popular where the Republican Party is, is a fighting party that is closely rivaling the Democratic Party. So. If you live in, in Vermont and everyone you know is an abolitionist and you never meet a Democrat, the wide awakes aren't as popular there as they are in central Pennsylvania, where the next town over might have Democrats who you want to beat in the election. So they're, they're, they're more prominent in the parts of the country where people are a little more moderate. But there are a lot of, uh, without a doubt, and they see themselves as an abolitionist movement in those parts of the country. They, they're very good at playing whatever works for their era you know being being coming from the american party in in nativist portions of the country and coming from german and scandinavian immigrants and in, in immigrant parts of the country we really the structure allows them to kind of have it all every way at the same time i had one more question were the wide awakes on on election day in the various states did the white when people this was back when people voted you took the parties the parties printed their own ballots right you took that ballot and you had to go in and vote and so people knew who you voted for. There really was no secret voting. Were the wide awakes present outside the polling places? Were they like a menacing presence to prevent people from voting non-Republican? Uh, menacing is in the eye of the beholder, I guess. Two, two wide awakes into Republicans. They're helping get out the vote, hand out tickets. They're guarding the polls from Democratic troublemakers. But if you're a Democrat, it does look like here are a bunch of young guys in uniforms patrolling your polling place, telling you to vote the other way. And people in the South before the election even are saying this election does not count. It's being completely swung by wide awake coercion. Lincoln could give himself a million votes if he wants. So there's there's no um there's no accountability to the wide awakes. And so they use it to discount the election actually preemptively. Um, it, it really depends on how you view it. There's not many examples of like real wide awake violence at the polls. But there are examples in New York City, for instance, of claims, pretty legitimate claims, that the wide awakes in New York City work to slow down voting in the Democratic leaning metropolis so that upstate can register more Republican votes. You know, that New York is a seesaw between Democratic city and uh, Republican upstate. And there there are accusations and they seem fairly legitimate that their wide awakes are working can challenge voters, slow down voting in Manhattan and in Brooklyn. So, so the state goes Republican. So they, weren't a bunch of naive, so they weren't a bunch of naive 19 year olds. It really depends on how you look at it. Um, <laughs> they knew what they were doing. <laughs> I mentioned something. I think Ed, some of them sure did. Yeah. Ed, can I mention something? Certainly. Um, it, this, it just strikes me that you know, this got started in Hartford and Ed, Edgar Jurgensen, you know, was he just noticed that they had uh, the the torches, you know, across the street and, you know, he stole one. And then him and his buddies got together and said, hey, you know, this would be fun. We'll just have these uniforms and we'll go out with these torches and we'll just escort Cassius Clay, who was in town. Um, and then Lincoln was just sort of like he just happened to be there the next the couple of days later. But this was really was it. And, and I guess it's the question for you. Was this more 
what their initial, these first five guys, I guess, was were they just out for having some fun or were they really out there to support the Republican Party or were they out there to support um, uh, Buckingham, I think, it was the, the guy that was running for, uh, he was the in incumbent governor when he was running for re-election in governor. Do you know like where their motivation was? Was it just kind of have a fun night out or was it they were really partisan people? It's a great question. Uh, they certainly didn't have any plan to form a mass movement, right? They, they all agree that, as they say afterwards, they build it better than they knew, that this local club they start took off as a national movement is uh, luck and convenient, not, not uh, any premeditated plan. They're, what we know about them is that they're partisan young guys. They read, the, they read the Republican papers in Hartford very closely and have a lot of hostility to the Democrats. Um, they don't seem, they're running, they, they start in this gubernatorial election, as you mentioned, for, for Buckingham, who's already the incumbent. And uh, they don't seem particularly excited about Buckingham as an individual. Some of them are excited about Seward and, and preemptively nominate Seward. When Lincoln wins the nomination, he's a really uh, galvanizing figure. They, I think the Wide Awakes are lucky that Lincoln was the nominee because they, they just motivate the movement so much. But um, I think they were out to have a local impact. If, if they had one motivation, and this is true of the Hartford Wide Awakes and a lot of the Wide Awakes, it was hostility to the local Democrats. There's a sense that there are people in their communities who are often running things, who are allied with the slave power, who are seen as stomping all over free speech, democracy, majority rule, and a sense that they want to win their community over away from the Democrats. And this, this hostility to the loco foco Democrats kind of builds into a movement of its own. But I think if there's any motivation to start, it's that they they have this often somewhat um, uh, ethnocultural, like demographic hostility to the Democrats in their communities. Okay. Well, with that, I don't see any more people with hands up or anything. This has been a great presentation, John. John will be presenting at the Lincoln Forum. Many of our members go up there at Gettysburg in November, so his book will be on sale in the bookstore up there, and I'm sure John will be available to autograph, sign his book up there. So with that, I thank everybody. I will stop the